Hello, Felix. It's great to have you on. Uh, how are you doing? Thank you. Hi, Tilman. Uh, thank you for having me today. I'm very excited to be on your show, on your podcast today. Um, it's my first interview or my first talk in English um, at all. So I'm really excited and uh, how this will turn out. I'm looking forward to it and to learn more from you about the German stock market. You're really an expert there. And I especially bought a cup for you. Um, it's a fun fact about Germany. I hope you can read it. Uh, fun facts about Germany. No fun in Germany. Go back to work. Yeah. <laughs> Is this true? Are we Germans so, so focused on work? <laughs> no, I don't think that's a stereotype. Uh, I don't think that's... You can't generalize that. I don't think so. No. I got this cup from Toby from Shopify. He founded this company in Canada and uh, I saw it on Twitter and had to get it as well. Okay. Uh, it's quite nice. As in every video, also here is the disclaimer. You can find the link to the disclaimer below in the show notes. The disclaimer says, always do your own work. What we're doing here is no recommendation and no advice. So please always do your own work. Thank you very much. You're investing How much fun is it to invest in uh, German German speaking countries? Well, for me, it's uh, a hell of a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, I'm doing this for 18 years now. So I've never done anything else in my life, in my career, but uh, focusing on the uh, German speaking stock market and especially the small and mid cap um, market. And for me, this is uh, as much fun today as it was 18 years ago. So this is a field which is never getting boring. Yeah, there's so much to learn, so much to experience, so much new things um, to learn. I mean, after 18 years uh, focusing on this segment, you might think that there's nothing new to come, but it, there is a lot of things that are new every day every week so it's not getting boring at all what new things are you learning in 2020 and 21 um i mean this is uh certainly a uh, time or if you look at the stock markets and the economy and all the things that happens around COVID, uh, certainly nobody of us has ever experienced that and uh, something like that before and it, more things like that or comparable to that in the outcome um, will happen in the future so but we can't tell today so we have to be uh, curious and have to see what future will bring um, but what i actually mean is not um, by the market itself but if you are analyzing balance sheets or stocks in general or companies um, at some point of time, you might think, okay, I've seen everything. I know the, uh, I know how to analyze the balance sheets. I know how to read them. I know how um, the, the accounting standards, um, but there's always something new that, that comes up that you can discover. And then you think about it and uh, you can incorporate it in all your, or in the analysis process. And that changes a little bit. And over time, this sums up. And so is the way of analyzing companies emerges and evolves. And yeah, so the way we are looking at company, companies today is much different than like five years ago or 10 years ago. It's a constant process that is um, developing over time. So what did change in your process over the last five or 10 years? Oh, there are so many things. Uh, this this would be a video on its own, actually. But just um, to to mention a few things, or let me think about a few a couple of things that we are doing differently than uh, like five years or ten years ago. What uh, over time has developed quite significantly is the um, metrics we are looking at. So like 10 years ago in the yeah, quite early stage of our company, um, I was very 
um, let's say that uh, valuation driven. Yeah, so I'm coming from that, from that deep value cigar butt approach. Yeah, we've been looking for cheap companies in terms of low price to book values, low um, price earnings ratios and stuff like that, good balance sheets, um, all that, that stuff. Over time, um, I've adopted this approach a little bit. Um, so today I'm saying a company's valuation is not measurable by a certain number, uh, for example, price earnings ratio, but it's dependent on the quality of the company. So the higher the quality of the company, the higher uh, the ratios may be or the valuations are just justified in a higher uh, range. So this is one example. So, but there are many, many others. So in the, in the soft fact uh, surrounding um, the way we look at competitive advantages, all these things um, changed over time. So it's just um, in the process of learning and getting experience by looking on companies, by analyzing companies. So this adds up slowly over time. And you can't even say this is like, um, there's one point in time when we change this and then happen that. So it's a process and it's fluid. That's interesting. Looking back on your history, you had, I think, um, two phases uh, before funding the fund and uh, after funding the fund. Um, maybe you can explain like the two phases a bit. Yeah, sure. Um, well, the whole thing started when I was in an... Um, exchange semester in university, of course, in my third semester. And I've been in the USA, in California, and I had a, a roommate where in, in the place where I live in. He was also from Germany and he was, um, or he realized I'm doing uh, all these um, uh, private transactions. So at night in, in California at night, was the time when in Germany the stock market opened, so I watched my private portfolio. And he said, okay, you're so keen on that, you're so behind um, this topic, isn't it possible for you to manage some money of mine as well? So this was the initial moment where I started to think about uh, money management. This was the first time. So and over the weeks and months, uh, these uh, ideas emerged um, I had no money at that time, or at least not, not very much. I had no access to investors. So there was no chance for me at all um, to start a mutual fund or any other vehicle. So the only option was, and this um, was quite a good option in the uh, time, or at that time, we started an investment club. My brother and I, back in, in Germany, started an investment club, um, mainly funded by family and friends. So with really uh, low money in the beginning. And this was the time um, when we started to track, obviously, our, our track record. Yeah. And this was more like a hobby, what we've done. But since from the start, from the beginning, we um, realized quite good returns. What kind of returns do you have history? in the history uh, when we are just looking at the at the uh, investment club from 2006 to 2000, 2014 there was an average return of around about 60 percent so after fees after costs and investment clubs are even higher costs than mutual funds are so this was um, quite quite good always but we did not do any active um, selling or we had no marketing, um, no sales. Um, but in 2014, we decided to do it more professionally and switch that uh, vehicle, the investment club, into a mutual fund. And since then, we are uh, in a, yeah, let's say, a professional framework. And from that point on, we developed, uh, we developed sales, we developed marketing further, um, but. Um, so we grew over time, obviously, in, in assets under management, as well as professionality regarding uh, sales and all these uh, topics. Uh, what never changed is our focus uh, 
on we, what we are investing in. So German small mid cap or German speaking um, small and mid caps has ever been the topic and this is definitely a constant in this long process over the meanwhile. In your fund, um, you have this idea of the investment club somehow embedded. So no, you're not a classical mutual fund. Um, you have different principles how you're building your fund. What principles are those? Well, from the structure, uh, this is a classic mutual fund. So, but our way of thinking, our, our way of um, communicating to our clients or to uh, investors, that's a little bit different, I guess, to many uh, other uh, other funds. So from the beginning on, uh, our or we said our differentiation and the competition clearly are other mutual funds, um, also in the, in the very beginning when we still were an investment club. So we said, okay, there must be some differentiation. And this was, in our point of view, transparency, because transparency still today is a major issue. Investors don't know what happened in, in the fund, what the fund manager does and why. And this is what we wanted to address. So from the very beginning, we, for example, um, showed the whole portfolio on our website. We still do. Um, I think we are the only mutual fund in Germany uh, who does it. I don't know any any other. Um, additionally, uh, we we put a lot of effort in a whole in, in communication. So we have a monthly client newsletter or magazine. So where we um, share a little bit about the way we're thinking, the way we're investing. We share insights to our portfolio companies and all those things. And yeah, I think this is it's an important topic or an important issue. Investors um, who know what's happening and what the fund management is doing and have a feeling or that gives them a feeling of security, a feeling of um, being involved. And this especially in difficult times is a major advantage. That's what we have experienced also in, in 2008, for example, in 2020, um, when the corona pandemic, pandemic um, came over us. Um, we experienced very little um, outflows of our fund. And I guess, or it's our thesis, one topic or one, one point is that Uh, our communication strategy keeps people involved and keeps them people on board. Yeah. So you build a kind of club that gives you also kind of patient capital, for, um, your investors giving in as they are committed to the strategy? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so this, this um, thought of being a club, this is still alive. With us, yeah. So over the time, of course, the um, client structure changes. It's not only um, retail private investors anymore, like in the very beginning of the investment club. Of course, over the time, professional investors came uh, on board as well, like um, asset managers um, and and banks, for example, or family offices. Um, but we all uh, share the same information with every client. Um, And so nobody is, or everybody who wants to get informed about what we're doing is able to get this information. I, I think this is an advantage for every kind of investor. It's not only uh, preferable for client or private, private investors, but for everybody. It's a good approach and quite interesting approach. Uh, How much I, actually, yeah. maybe, maybe can I, I can add some, sure. or one more sentence about that. I actually don't understand why not more more money managers or, my, or fund managers or funds um, are communicating more openly because it's known that people are withdrawing money, especially when crises come up, when people get afraid of what is, is happening. Yeah. And A constant communication helps be or helps helps clients or investors being sticky and, and for understanding that this will go over 
and this the better times will come again. And so this is I'm quite curious about why others are not doing that. Mm -hmm. How much skin in the game do you have in the funds? Me personally, I'm uh, with 100% of my private capital invested in our both funds. Yeah, our team members um, also are all invested with major parts of their private capital in our funds. So we have a lot of skill in the game. That's good to hear. And also your friends and family are also fully or yeah. a lot of inv Definitely. invested. So you have, have to be careful. So otherwise mama will be angry. <laughs> well, I, I would always want that a money manager I'm giving my money to uh, invest in the same strategy as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, this aligns the interests of both parties. And I guess that's the best thing you can have or you can achieve. Sure it is. You have two strategies. What are these strategies and what was the first strategy and what is the second strategy? Well, the, the strategies are not that different, actually. So we have two uh, public traded or public available mutual funds. It's the Alpha Star Axiom Fund and Alpha Star Dividend Fund. The Axiom Fund, this is uh, our basic product, our first product, um, and the, the um, succeeder of the investment club. Um, this is a fund where we just invest and reinvest um, the gains, capital gains, um, and the Alpha Star Dividend Fund is a mutual is also a mutual fund which follows the same principles concerning the companies we're choosing, but it's uh, distributing cash in quarterly. Um, in, quarterly, in a quarterly rhythm to its shareholders or to its clients. So that's the main difference. So the one is not distributing, the other one is distributing, and that's this, it's doing it quarterly. So 1% per quarter, 4% per year is uh, what um, uh, investors are getting out of this dividend, dividend fund. Yeah. I also already want to show um, the live um, composition of the Axian 4 um, because you have it on the website. But before we go into details about this, this fund and look at uh, certain securities, um, I want to discuss a bit um, the universe you're investing in. Um, How would you describe the universe you're investing in in the German-speaking countries like Germ Germany, Austria, and Switzerland? Yeah, well, uh, it's um, not so easy in terms of uh, we are, we are not in, in terms of like like uh, industry or something like that. We are not focusing on certain industries, for example. Uh, what I love about companies is quality. Yeah, I mentioned this before. Quality is um, Of course, a, a broad, broad range of possible uh, meanings. But what we mean by this is we prefer companies, for example, that grew over time organically. So what I don't like is um, companies that buy other companies over and over again, uh, leverage this or leverage the balance sheets. So I like proprietary technologies. I like companies that have developed something products, software, whatever, and have, have uh, developed those products over time. And this focus on a product and making this better and better over a long period of time, this is what I like the most. Because if you have such companies, those are the companies which are most likely the ones that have barriers of entry that have competitive, competitive advantages because they have put so much effort over a certain amount of years in being the best in that area um, in which they operate. So this is uh, in, in, a, in a broad sense uh, what we are looking for. Yeah. And how big is the universe you're covering? I think you once had 300 stocks or around that number? 
Yeah, I mean, in a German-speaking country, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, taking the three countries together, we have around 1,500 companies. And our, our focus is much narrower. What we are trying to do is to invest in the 30 companies. So this is 2% out of those 1,500 companies. So the best 30 companies, this is our type. Of course, the um, watch list we are focusing on and we are covering is a little bit broader. It's like 50 stocks to 100 stocks, but the really narrow range, the, um, I, I always compare it a little bit with, the, with a football team or something like a little sports team. Yeah, you have a whole team, but only a certain amount of uh, players are on the pitch. Uh, and this, those players in our case is the 30 ones that are in our portfolios and 20 to 30, 40 others are sitting on the, on the bench and waiting, um, to, to, to get on the pitch at a certain time. So the reasons why they are out and not on the, on the field is they are different to this could be because they are too expensive or the, the time is not right to get in this stock. Uh, several reasons. So, but what we are trying, 2% of the 1,500 um, stocks should be on the pitch. Germans like soccer, uh, but sometimes there are soccer players in Germany that play big fouls. We had a uh, problem with Wirecard and also allegations against Kränke in the last uh, years uh, or the last year. Um, how do you make sure you don't, you, you stay away from frauds? Well, um, you never can be sure um, in, in 400%, of course. Um, but if you're focusing on high quality, the um, probability to get in such a trap is much lower, obviously. But for example, so we are focusing on companies, as I described uh, with a um, a long history, a long standing history, and a long standing history of excellence. So, those companies are um, characterized very often by high returns on invested capital, by high cash flows, clean balance sheets. So, if you have a, a company with a clean balance sheet and no, no, not much um, uh, specialties, not much leverage, uh, not much. Um, intangible assets, all these, all these things and the accounting uh, specialties, then like, like, for example, Cranky is a good example. It's very complex, very um, um, a difficult balance sheet and difficult accounting principles that are um, there. You won't set, find such things uh, within our portfolio. Yeah. And this easiness and cleanliness in the balance sheet and the business model and this whole structure, it's also a structure, uh, structural things um, with companies that reduces the probability of failure a lot, I guess. Let's go back to um, the overview of your portfolio and um, try to understand a bit how you are constructing uh, this portfolio. So. What, is the, what are the principles that have led to this portfolio? Yeah, so um, principally or basically we want to have a quite narrow portfolio. So it must be at most 20 companies. So this is um, what we also see today. There's only 20 companies and there won't be anymore. So if we add another company, if we say we find another company, then we need to decide which one or which, which other company uh, should leave. Yeah, so this is, uh, I think, important. Uh, the other thing is concerning the, the single companies that we are, have a strong, that we have a strong focus on return on invested capital. I think this is our main value driver. We want companies that, are, yeah, that, that produce high yields on their capital. So this is, um, yeah, 
the main factors, I would say. What does you lead to sell a company besides that you found a better one? Um, what are reasons to sell for you? Well, this, this is the most uh, common reason. Yeah? So companies change over time. They, they uh, evolve over time. So, and from time to time, we find a company which offers a better opportunity. This is the major factor we are selling. So, of course, there can be reasons uh, concerning pricing when we say companies get too um, expensive, but this is actually not the case very often. Uh, because, as I, as I explained or as I mentioned before, um, if you have high quality companies with a high return on investment capitals and high cash flows. So it's possible to um, allow uh, allow a company or allow the stock to rise a little bit over um, or a little bit too much and, and as a higher pricing is ex more acceptable there. Yeah? Uh, because you know that this company will grow into this valuation quite uh, soon or even 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 more if that company comes down at some point of time because of high valuation you always have the opportunity uh, without having to think about to uh, buy new shares or additional shares yeah. so what we do if companies are getting too expensive or a little bit uh, yeah too expensive then we obviously reduce the weighting in the portfolio, um, but we almost never sell them because of high price. Uh, we don't sell the complete position. We drive down the valuation and put uh, the weight on, on cheaper stocks a little bit higher. So the impact if the valuation is coming down is not that big on the portfolio. But if you have a great company, there's um, not really a reason to sell it completely. With 20 stocks, you have like 5% five per, uh, five position for every position, like in the medium, like how big can your positions go? Like from just yeah. 1% till 10% or what is the size you're, yeah. how, how are you sizing? Um, as we are a mutual fund, we are bound to certain rules. So you might be familiar with the 5, 10, 40 rule, uh, which says there's one single stock uh, is not allowed to be bigger than 5% in weighting. But there are exceptions. And these except in, in or the exception says that certain, um, a certain amount of stocks can be up to 10% in weight. But all these exceptions together cannot be more than 40%. So if you um, take this 4, 5, uh, 4, 10, uh, 5, 10, 40 rule, and you take also the need to, be, to, have, to have a quite um, narrow portfolio, then the consequence is you can do, over, do an overweight on like four or five stocks. And all the other stocks is in, in our wording regular weighting of four percent. So the we have in a, in a portfolio of twenty stocks, we have fifteen stocks uh, at four percent, and we have five stocks at seven percent. So this is roughly the the, uh, the sizes we are uh, aiming at. That's interesting. Maybe let's go into detail for some of the stocks you have in your portfolio. Um, you have one stock that's also quite common for some of the American investors because uh, it was one of the stocks that was also kind of promoted uh, internationally. It's Endor. What is Endor doing and why do you like it? Yeah, I, well, Endor is, is one wonderful example for the companies or for the, for the high quality companies I mentioned before. Yeah. I mean, they're doing uh, gaming equipment. So it's really uh, uh, easy to understand business model. 
they are doing the steering wheels, the wheelbases, and uh, the, the gear shifts, and so on, the pedals for uh, sim racing, so for computer games, uh, for computer gamers. But they are focusing on the high end segment on that. So um, the products they are producing are not comparable to what you buy in a, in a toy store somewhere yeah, for your kids. But they are high end and they are simulating like real life, uh, real life experience. Yeah? And they actually um, are used as well in real life. So, for example, they made a steering wheel for a BMW. And this is actually used, you can use it for gaming, but it's actually used in the BMW, it's a GT3 uh, racing car. So it's the uh, same thing. And this company focuses only on this narrow range of products and has put all its focus over many years on getting better and better and improving quality and experience with these products. So really a niche market they are addressing. But they are the leading ones there. They have a market share of like 80% or something uh, in that area. And that's that's uh, really, really interesting. So that they are a leading company, you see by all the partnerships they, they have. Obviously, they, they are partnering with the console um, or the game console uh, producers like Microsoft, Sony yeah, for Xbox and, and PS uh, PlayStation. Uh, but also they have cooperations with the racing associations like Formula One and NASCAR, the World Rally, at, um, uh, World Rally Association or uh, Championship. So, but also with the car manufacturers, like they're partnering with BMW, Porsche, and so on. So you see, they are really, um, yeah, on top of the whole gaming or a whole racing, sim racing um, industry. And this is uh, what makes it interesting. And that's what you see in the numbers as well then. So if you look at the growth history over the last couple of years, it has, uh, have been growing tremendously and that with quite high margins. And additionally, they have slow asset business. You know, so they, they have um, put their brain power into the product over the last couple of years and this materializes over time. Yeah. So this is a, a one perfect, perfect example. Says those are companies uh, we love. The company is founder-led. Uh, I think, what percentage does the founder own? Do you know the number out of your head? I don't know. I don't know. 40, 50%, something like that. Yeah. 40, 30%. Is this important for your approach to have founder-led companies or... Um, not necessarily. I like that. Yeah. This is um, like like we had before. If the founder is involved in his own company, has it ha he has skin in the games, you have the same um, alignment of interests. Like like uh, when when I am invested in my own fund. Yeah. So this is um, definitely something we like, but it's not a must have. Another company um, in your portfolio that is, I think it's quite long in there. I see it's from, you bought it 2014, is IFAU. Uh, what do you like about this company? Well, the same thing here. This is, uh, they are addressing a niche market, yeah? but this market um, is big enough to give this company an opportunity to grow over a long period of time. And that's what they have done. Um, so they, addressing the public transport market and the rail market with software solutions. So ERP systems, uh, organizing systems uh, for those uh, public transport companies. And all this uh, digitalization that is happening around us um, is, of course, given them uh, tablets. And also here you see it in the numbers. If you look at the growth rates over the last couple of years and the um, development of the margins, so the, the scaling of the uh, business uh, sets in over over the years. And actually, this is one we we have this company even longer. We also, I guess, we had it uh, since 2007 or eight. I can't even remember. Maybe 2009. 
So the first price we bought uh, IFAU was at one euro. So over time. Um, it's at 18 at the moment. This is a real long term. In I, I guess it's the longest engagement uh, in any stock we have. Yeah. It's quite interesting. So that you're really a long term shareholder and uh, be willing to be invested in a company for the long term. Yeah. So this is this is what we aim for. Uh, it's not always working because, um, so of course, uh, things things change. Yeah? Uh, things uh, might happen, and as we have a very narrow portfolio, um, so this it happens that there's a change in the portfolio. But I guess over the next couple of years, it's probably uh, less turnover necessary than it was before in the last couple of years because. Um, well, at least for the moment being, I can say I, I feel quite comfortable with the portfolio we have, the companies in, in, in a whole. So if you just look at 2020, those companies uh, we own right now have developed very good despite recession, despite Corona, um, because they are focusing on growing or they are active in growing markets. Um, so. I really feel comfortable right now with this portfolio, and I, uh, I think there's there will be less turnover actually than than in the past. Yeah. Are you a pure bottom-up stock picker in your approach, I, or are you investing around certain topics as well? It's it's pure bottom-up if you if you want. Um, I mean, I'm doing this for 18 years, and it's uh, it's, it's it's a limited limited amount of companies you have in, in the German speaking market. So I would say I know most of them, at least, at least roughly. Yeah. And if you, so additionally, my, it's my opinion, it's the best way to invest. So go take one stock, look at it, decide what you do, um, kick, kick it out or uh, go further then take the next and the next and the next. I, I think that's the best way um, to find the best best stocks. Um, but of course, if from time to time, you read something, you get an idea about a certain industry, a certain trend. Um, and then I, I, I think about, okay, what companies do I know which could benefit from this um, certain trend? Yeah. Um, but then, of course, I am not buying this company uh, uh, blind, blindly. But of course, I do the whole uh, process uh, of analyzing the stock and checking if that hypothesis might be true that this company is profiting or benefiting from the from this certain trend. Yeah. So, for example, I can, I can say one example. We've been um, thinking about the whole electric car and battery business so lately so we have been thinking about what company might be interesting for us in this environment yeah. so but you have of course in the small cap uh, sector and in germany no possibility or not not too many possibilities to invest directly yeah i mean VW or VW would have been a nice investment, but it's totally out of our uh, scope. I don't, uh, or we don't invest in this in such large, large companies. But they are, we are thinking, or, or we are always thinking the first or, or second, um, or one step further, or two steps further, and uh, have a look at the um, companies that might indirectly benefit from such trends. So this is what you obviously have to do many times in the, in the small cap segment because there are just no direct players. I could not invest in a Tesla-like stock in the, in the small cap EV market. Yeah. So but you have to see who is uh, delivering certain parts to uh, certain batteries, uh, or in this special case, in, in the batteries. Um, yeah, that's, that's the way we approach if we do this this kind of industry. One new edition of you is called GK Software. Um, what do you like about this company? Hey, Tillman here. I'm sure you're curious about the answer to this question. 
But this answer is exclusive to the members of my community, Good Investing Plus. Good Investing Plus is a place where we help each other to get better as investors day by day. If you are an ambitious, long-term oriented investor that likes to share, please apply for Good Investing Plus. Just go to good-investing.net slash plus. You can also find this link in the show notes. I'm waiting for your application. And without further ado, let's go back to the conversation. That's an interesting method and a good method, I think. Looking out um, in the next five years, where do you see AlphaStar then? Yeah, interesting question. Um, what we uh, have done or what we have done so far, and we've talked about it uh, the last couple of minutes, um, we are focused on the German speaking market so far. Um, but of course, this market is limited. And for example, our uh, funds are also, or we intentionally keep them quite small. So for example, the Aktien form, we closed it at a volume of 50 million, just to give it to opportunity to grow via um, return over the next couple of year, years without having to leave our focus, without having to change our strategy. Yeah. Um, this is the intention, uh, because the outcome will be that we have the potential to achieve those returns that we have achieved in the past also for the next couple of years. So this is the main most important point or most important um, uh, topic for us. So, but As I said, we try to invest in 2% of the best companies in the German speaking market. So obviously the volume is limited, we can put in. So for the next five years, you will see a new mutual fund we are setting up, but with a broader range in Germany. We are, uh, we are um, intending to set up a new fund, which is focused or which is um, covering the Alpha Star strategy on the European market. For that, we are um, setting up the sales right now. So we're expanding in the area of sales marketing. And of course, we are looking for new people, for fund managers, for portfolio managers, which can bring or which bring know-how about the European stock market, about the European small mid-cap landscape into our company, because we cannot cover this uh, on our own, of course. Do they have to work in Augsburg? Well, it's a difficult topic. Um, preferably, from my point of view today, would be um, it's an advantage. Um, because investing is a lot about talking to each other and um, exchanging thoughts And this, of course, is possible nowadays via uh, video conferencing or traditional calls, but it's not the same. So if you take your time, uh, if you talk about, I don't know, certain topics about uh, is a certain thing about a company a competitive advantage, yes or no. So if you have this discussion, it's much more effective, I guess, uh, if you take your time. Um, if you talk um, about that and think about it quietly, um, I have the feeling uh, that video conferencing, for example, um, always is a little bit more, um, how do you say that? It's not that relaxed as you're, as you're sitting on a couch uh, with a coffee in your hand and to, uh, jointly thinking about things. Yeah? But um, of course, I would not totally exclude this as an option. Yeah, I mean, the, the possibilities to communicate clearly are there. Um, this is certainly, uh, certainly, certainly, certainly uh, not a no go. But I guess there are slight advantages on being present. So, if there are any investors interested uh, to apply, uh, I will add a link below so people can find. The job offers if they are still open yeah yeah that's a good good idea um uh, i'm really looking forward to anybody who is uh yeah uh, interested in working with us 
Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a nice project. And um, what we have, I mean, what we have achieved with the AlphaStar Axiom 4 is that we are leading the rankings in Germany over a couple of years now. That's what we want to achieve in Europe with the, with the new European fund as well. And I mean, it's a, a project that is um, built up from the scratch. And so there's nothing there yet. Um, but of course, we have the selling power and we have the marketing power, um, which we can use as soon as we start. Um, and I think I think that's a challenging and very, a very nice opportunity for anybody who's uh, interested in, in um, the European stock market. Yeah. That's good. I'm happy to share this. Um, Thank you. For the end of our interview, is there something you want to share we haven't discussed that might be interesting for the viewer? Maybe maybe one aspect that is important for us, um, which we have not been talking about so far, is the whole topic about management evaluation. Um, so what you often hear if people or investors are assessing management quality, um, talking about personal uh, things, and they, of course, their management must be uh, uh, trustable, uh, must be reliable, all this stuff. It, of course, it's important. Um, but the thing is that we think you, that we can, or it is, you can measure the quality of the management as well. So out of the numbers. So for example, um, what a management team can do is to control the balance sheet. And so if you have a look at the balance sheet, you see how the management is operating, how the management is doing their business. So are they um, capitalizing intangible assets, for example? Are they leveraging? Are they growing uh, anorganically? Are they doing many acquisitions, all that stuff? So the quality of accounting principles or the, the, the way they address accounting principles, the way they want to uh, um, shape their balance sheet, all this is an indication of how the management is thinking and behaving. Uh, this is maybe one thing. And the other uh, uh, point is, of course, the whole capital allocation topic. Yeah? I mean, as I said before, our main driver or the main value driver is return on invested capital. And of course, um, this is in then the main driver for growth as well. So if a company has high return on invested capital, then the capital allocation decision is crucial for the growth. So growth is a function of the quality of the business in terms of return on capital and the reinvestment. So it makes a difference if the management decides, for example, to make an acquisition with a certain amount of available money, or if they are, for example, reinvesting the capital into their own business in terms of development of new products or uh, the exploration of new markets and stuff like that. So this is, of course, a, a criti critical point because it's all coming back to the topic return on invested capital and growth as, as important value drivers in the long, in the long run. Yeah. Very interesting point for the end. And thank you very much for taking the time. And thank you very much to the audience as well for listening to this interview. Thank you for having me. It was fun talking to yeah. you. Um, As I said in the VR Review, my first interview yeah. in English, I hope I was understandable or it was understandable. I think you are. Yeah, if, if there are any comments um, or if you want to know anything else, um, we, of course, you can contact me anytime. And uh, of course, we can talk in German then as well. So yeah. this is better to understand. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the invite. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.